Yeah. So, so yesterday we talked about structures within the flower. We talked about pollen, ovules, and so forth. Today we're going to talk about pollination itself. And yesterday we mentioned that there's two types of pollination that could happen. Self-pollination and cross-pollination. Which is more beneficial to the species? Bella? How come? Yeah, it leads to more variation within the species, which is beneficial and natural stuff. So I said, I mentioned yesterday that there's a few different ways that plants often um, encourage cross-pollination. Because you might say, well, we have a flower like this. We have anthers that are producing pollen. We have the stigma right here. Well, it would be very easy for the pollen grain just to fall onto the stigma and pollinate the same flower. Okay, that would be self-pollination. But it, there's actually a whole bunch of different adaptations plants have to prevent that from happening. And we'll talk about a few of those. One of them is the timing. Because if you remember from yesterday, we looked at that flower sort of opening up and maturing. Well, the structures within the flower also take time to mature. And often, one part, either the male or female structures, will mature first. Um, for example, if the anthers mature, produce their pollen, but the stigma and the pistil is not fully developed yet, well, even if pollen lands on the stigma, nothing will happen because it's not ready to receive pollen yet. So that would encourage cross-pollination because this, this pollen would be more likely to fertilize other flowers. Um, and if you ever look at, next week we're going to look at some actual flowers. And if you sort of have some, even like from the, a bouquet or something, if you put them in some water, they'll stay alive for a little while. You can actually see the structures within the flower mature over time and change. And so we'll look at some of that next week. So that's one thing. We call that timing. So the male and female parts mature at different times. So that self-pollination doesn't happen. There are also some flowers that don't have both male and female reproductive parts. This flower is, has both. It's called a perfect flower. But if we had a flower that did not have the pistil in it and only had these parts, okay, obviously in this case, self-pollination is impossible because there's only the male structures. Okay? Or some would have no stamen and only have the pistil. So if you look at this, some examples, squash or cucumbers, grass plants, all have imperfect flowers. So if you look at this flower, is this a male or female flower? Female. Yeah, it just has the pistil in the center, and this would be a male flower. And that encourages cross-pollination versus self-pollination. There are also certain biochemical means in which pollen grains from one plant, even if they do land on the stigma of the same flower, are not compatible. And the pollen grain actually just won't grow. So it's another biochemical means of encouraging cross-pollination. There are even some plants in which, not just from flower to flower, but from plant to plant, like one plant, this is in some trees. One tree is only male flowers. And another tree of the same species is only female flowers. And obviously most sort of plants, self-pollination is impossible. It's going to definitely be between two different individuals. So the point is cross-pollination is usually encouraged because it results in greater variation for the species. So how does the pollen travel then? How does pollen from one flower reach the stigma of another flower to pollinate it and to fertilize those ovules? Well, there's a couple important ways. One is through wind pollination. So in the springtime or in the fall sometimes, you may come out of your house and your driveway is all covered in like yellow or green pollen. That's pollen. And it's likely that all that pollen came from plants that are wind-pollinated. Uh, lots of 
evergreen trees are wind pollinated. <clears throat> and wind pollinated flowers look quite different usually than animal pollinated flowers. For example, the pollen grains themselves in wind pollinated species are usually very, very small, very light, and there's a lot of them. Because they're just sort of going to be randomly blowing in the wind, it takes a lot of pollen in order to pollinate some of the female parts. The anthers that produce the pollen are exposed so that as the wind blows across the flowers, it picks up the pollen once it matures and takes it in the wind. The stigmas themselves often have a unique shape. Here you see all these fine filaments here, there to catch pollen as it's blowing through the wind. And usually they have very small petals, okay? because it doesn't make any sense to, to grow large petals if you're not trying to attract any um, animals. Do you think they have nectar? No. No. Because no. the wind doesn't care about nectar, right? Wouldn't make sense to invest energy in producing nectar if you don't need animals to come visit your flowers for pollination. Do you think they have a strong scent or aroma? No. Animal pollinated flowers are very common. Here's an, oh, here's an example. This is wind pollination sort of in the process. These are from some sort of uh, pine tree. These are the flowers. Okay? You can see this stuff looks like smoke. That's pollen being blown off of those anthers and travel through the air. So animal pollinators include many insects, lots of birds, and even some mammals act as pollinators of some flowers. <clears throat> so animals often will visit flowers. Why? Why would an animal go and visit a flower? Calvin? Yeah, because usually animal pollinated flowers provide a reward for animals visiting them. And often that's in the form of nectar. Nectar is basically a sugary solution that's produced by the flower, sort of stored up, and Many different types of animals use nectar as a source of food. <laughs> and so as they go from flower to flower, feeding, while they're feeding, they also rub up against the anthers and get pollen on them. Here, for example, you have a bee, and it's almost covered in pollen. As it was feeding from the nectar, it brushed against the mature um, anthers and got pollen all over it. As it goes to visit another flower, some of this pollen is going to fall off and reach the stigma of the, another flower and pollinate that flower. And the pollen is spread by animals. Birds, same thing. As they feed in the flowers, they get pollen on them. Or here's an example of a bat covered in pollen. So all that yellow stuff is pollen all over it. So as it goes flower to flower, it can't help but spread that pollen from one plant to another. Now, different types of animals need different, have different nutritional requirements. Like a bee requires very much less food than a bat or a bird. And so often, the concentration of sugars in the nectar has evolved to carefully match the needs of whatever pollinator commonly visits that way. Yeah, you have um, another type of food is pollen itself is sometimes a food. Some animals do eat the pollen itself. It's high in protein. And again, in the process of eating the pollen, they get a lot of pollen on them. <coughs> so flowers generally want to attract these pollinators. And you can tell a little bit about the types of animals that might visit a flower by looking at it. The color of the flower is important. Flowers are colorful usually to attract certain types of pollinators. For example, bees 
see well in the blue end of the spectrum, the yellow end of the spectrum, but they also can see ultraviolet. Um, and that's a range of color that's beyond our vision. We can't see it. But bees and other insects can see it. So often flowers have markings in the ultraviolet end of the spectrum to attract bees. Birds can see red really well. And so often red flowers are meant to attract birds. Does anyone have a hummingbird feeder at home? Or have you seen one? You know? And what, do you, what color is it? It's always red. The flowers that they drink from are almost always red. You even put food coloring in the sugary solution that goes in it to make it red because that's what um, birds see the best. Bats, on the other hand, don't see very well in terms of color. And they often are feeding at night. So bat pollinated flowers often are large and they're white so that they stand out better at night. Here you have an example of a hummingbird feeding inside these flowers. Again, if you notice the shape of these flowers, how is this shape different than like a bee pollinated flower? Willa? Yeah, it's long and narrow. Like a bee would never be able to crawl into there to get nectar. But a hummingbird with a longer beak is able to put its beak into there to reach the nectar. So these flowers have co-evolved with hummingbirds to sort of perfectly match each other. Many flowers also have what's called nectar guides. I have some more pictures of this, which I'll show you. Nectar guides are markings that are often in ultraviolet colors. Whereas, like, for example, this flower, as dandelion, it looks just yellow to us. But if you change sort of the colors in the spectrum, this is what it might look like to a bee. It has other markings that make it clear where the bee should go to find the nectar. The scent and aroma of flowers is also often used to attract pollinators. That's why flowers smell nice. But not all flowers do smell nice. There are flowers that smell like dung and rotting flesh. Why do you think they might have that role? Yeah, things like flies okay, might be attracted to flowers that smell um, like rotting flesh, because that's what flies eat. So what can I, so what we see can be in the eye world, like it can look different. Yes. Yes. Yeah, like this is what it looks like to us. This is what it would look like to a bee. So what does that add? What's that? Like what does that add? It looked to us? No, to it. It would look like this to a bee, probably. So bees are very commonly predator, um, pollinators. Okay. And they're one of the most important pollinators. Okay. And bee pollinated flowers often will have those nectar guides. Like here's another example. Again, yeah, just looks like a plain yellow flower, but it actually has these markings in the ultraviolet end of the spectrum that attract the bee, showing up where to go. And so, yeah, you might have it different. We change this up a little bit. I think you made it. Maybe don't have this slide at all. That's okay. So bees feed on nectar in flowers. They consume it for energy. And then they also make what with it? Honey. 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 Yeah, honey is what bees make with that nectar. It has to be processed by the bees. Um, and so bees go visit lots of different flowers. They have a special stomach inside of them where they can store up this nectar. And they have special enzymes which help break down the sugar. They bring it back to the hive. And then they regurgitate it into another bee's mouth Ew. who further digests it and then they regurgitate it into another bee's mouth and this process repeats further digesting those um, sugars in the nectar eventually they spit it into a little hexagonal honeycomb and then bees go near it and they flap their wings very hard and they evaporate much of the water 
to make it more concentrated, and eventually it forms honey. They put a little wax pack over it, and then that honey is stored up for later usage. So that's so how that's honey is made. So we eat like puke so yeah. the, the delicious sugary honey from the tree. Yeah. It still tastes, tastes the same as it used to taste. Puke. Just because it's all right, so regurgitated bees. Yeah, so, 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 so when we, someone drinks tea, they literally add bee bark. Yes. What color? Mm -hmm. It flaps its wings like a round no, stone. Like a small yeah. thing that you do. Because I heard it like a bee's nest. 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 Like these are social insects. There's certain types of insects called social insects. They have, there's different types of bees. They have very well-defined roles. You have worker bees, queen bees, drones, and so forth. Um, and bees actually can communicate with each other. When a bee finds a source of flowers that are um, rich with nectar, they actually tell other bees how to get to those flowers. But they don't do it by making any sound. You know how they do it? They dance. Yeah, they do it, what's called the waggle dance. Yep. The waggle dance of the bee is when a bee finds the flowers of nectar, goes back to its hive, and then the other bees watch it, does a little dance where it shakes its butt, does this little corkscrew, right. comes back, right. then it shakes it some more, right. loops the other way. The angle that the bee is going in relation to the hive tells the other bees which direction to go in relation to the sun, and the length of how big its waggling part is tells them how far away it is, and the intensity of their waggleness tells how good the nectar is in that area. So bees can actually communicate pretty extensively using the little waggle dance. So next time you guys go to the next school dance, gather around, somebody can do the waggle dance to tell you where to go. Oh, wait. Where'd it go? Oh, let's watch this is a little bit. Oh, I want to tell you one more thing about bees. So people keep bees, you know, that's like they have bees in their yard or in the field. You, I'm sure you've seen them. Even if you didn't know what they were, if you've been driving along the highway and you see out in like a field, like a box, it looks like almost a dresser drawer. It's got drawers in it. Those are beehives people take and they slide out and people take care of the bees and so forth. Um, they make honey, people sell the honey to them. But also, some people that keep bees like that, they um, hire their bees out. And a farmer or somebody that owns an apple orchard might pay somebody that's a beekeeper to bring these boxes of their beehives to their apple orchard and station them there for a period of time, maybe a couple weeks. Why would they pay somebody to bring bees to their orchard? Huh? Put honey on the apples. No. Alex? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what do apples start at? Start out as? Trees. Trees. Flowers. So on an apple tree, you have apple blossoms, apple flowers. They do not they do not form actual apple fruits unless they're pollinated. You have an apple blossom, apple flower that didn't get pollinated, it won't form a fruit. It won't form an actual apple. So people pay to bring bees to their orchard or to their almond grove and let the bees out. The bees will visit all the apple flowers and all the almond flowers, pollinating them, ensuring the best um, yield of apples or almonds or whatever. So it's a lot, they'll put up a whole semi-tractor trailer filled with beehives, bring them to a big farm, unload them, let them sit there for a week, and then they can bring them to another farm and so forth. Do you guys know Tim um, Abraham, our, the school trainer? He keeps these. It's one of the things he does on the side. So um, lots of people do it as a hobby. Uh, lots of questions about bees. Yeah. Is that, like, in Washington, D.C., they have all those apples? Cherry blossoms. They have a cherry blossom, right? <laughs> apple blossom. Apple blossom. No, they are, right? No, cherry, cherry, cherry blossom. But it's the same thing. A cherry only forms after a blossom, after the so flower that's why forms. So called like cherry blossoms? Yes. Because it turns into a cherry I thought it was because it was just like Those are cherry trees, and the blossoms are the flowers, yes. Wow, 
Did you like watch that movie? <laughs> 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 like the cartoon movie? I did not. I hate that movie. Alright guys. Did they bring these back? They put them, oh they just, they return back to their hive. They just go after they oh. pollinate flowers, they all come back to the hive. Alright so watch this video. It kind of goes over a bunch of the stuff I just was talking about. So butterflies are pollinators. Butterflies have this long proboscis that fits into flowers to reach the nectar. Flies are attracted to those flowers that smell like a rotting meat. They even will lay their eggs on these flowers. The larvae don't actually survive because there's no actual food there. Bats pollinate at night, so often bat pollinated flowers are white. And we have birds. Sorry, birds have good sense of color, so bird pollinated flowers are often very brightly colored. They don't have a great sense of smell, so often they don't have a strong aroma to them, strong odor. Um, so, have a seat, we're open. Wind pollinated flowers versus animal. Animals, petals are large, colorful. Wind, they're not, they're small, often green. Animal pollinated flowers have an aroma usually. Wind pollinated flowers do not. Animal pollinated flowers have nectar to attract pollinators. Wind pollinated flowers do not have that nectar. Animal pollinated flowers don't produce as much pollen. Wind pollinated flowers need lots of pollen because it's just sort of randomly blowing through the air to um, reach various to reach various um, flowers. So you've seen corn plants before? Yes. It's a corn plant, right? Yeah. The top part is actually the male stigmas that produce pollen. That's where the pollen comes from. These, the anthers are up here. The stigma is actually attached to each ear of corn. If you look, if you were to take all the leaves off of an ear of corn, each kernel has one long style attached to it. That's what the silk of a corn is. Those are the styles. If you look at just one kernel, that's the style. At the end would be the stigma. That would be pollinated. And if you ever got an ear of corn and like the end is, has no like yellow kernels, that's because those kernels were never pollinated. Only some of them were. All right, so we'll learn more about pollination. It's really interesting. Time to wrap the movie. Watch on Monday.